<laughs> um, so we'll talk about how the operating system um, uh, interacts with the CPU. We'll talk about CPU mechanisms that exist to allow the operating system to do things it needs to do. Uh, we'll talk about some of the abstractions that the operating system creates to allow processes and other parts of the system to, to use the CPU and the illusions that uh, the operating system is able to create about the CPU. And then we'll talk a little bit at the end about policies related to the CPU, specifically about process scheduling. Um, OK, so, so I posted the first three assignments on the website. Um, the submission is not open for many questions, but if you guys kind of want to work ahead, it should give you a feeling for, for what's coming. Um, we're, so we're working, in, uh, working on sort of getting the, the automatic grader set up. Once that's running, that will be what will grade your script and implementation submissions. Um, for the, for the code, so in, in general, for the questions we're asking you guys to submit through the website in order to get credit for the assignments, there's this sort of multi-step process that involves first, potentially, if you want to, saving an answer. This allows you to kind of save your work and, and not necessarily uh, submit right away. And then when you're ready to have your answer graded, you hit the Submit button. And that will do one of two things. If the auto grader is involved, that'll kind of wake up the auto grader and tell it that you have something to grade. And that process might take a few hours, depending on what else is in the queue. Um, if we're, you know, we're, as much as we would love to, there are certain questions that we can't grade using scripts, like your code reading answers and design documents for later assignments. Those will be, have to be graded by the course staff. So in that case, submission asks us to look at those things. And then the latency might be even longer, like several days, maybe. Um, once your questions are graded, you'll have a chance to look at, at your score. And potentially, and I haven't decided about this yet, um, for some of the code reading and design documents, we may give you guys like two shots, right? So we may say, you know, here's the answer you submitted, here's the grade we assigned. If you would like to keep that grade, you'll be able to finalize your score, which will show you the answers. So for the code reading questions, they're all, we have the correct answers all, you know, in the website somewhere, but clearly we can't show them to you until you're willing to accept whatever score we gave you for those questions, right? So there, but there might be, we might give you guys another shot at those. So there might be a chance where we say, OK, this is wrong. If you guys want to go and keep thinking about it or go look in the code again and, and get it right, then you have that shot. Otherwise, you can hit finalize. And then you take the score that you have, and we show you what the answer is. Does that make sense? OK. We probably aren't going to give you like six or 10 tries on the code reading questions just because we're going to get sick and tired of grading them. right? So it might be like two. OK. Uh, same thing with the design documents, but we'll see. Um, for the for the scripts and for the implementation problems, probably what we're going to do is those won't be finalized until like a couple days before the end of the semester. And then we'll just finalize everything at once. Right? So those, you are welcome to submit as many times as you want. There's no overhead to the course staff or grading. All right, and then any bugs you find on the website, please report on Piazza, or that is, is one of the things that you can use the staff email list for. I've been trying to direct people off the staff email list onto Piazza because it's a better place for those sorts of things, especially when there are questions related to material or uh, things on the assignment. You know, if you send it to staff, then it's going to sit there for six hours until we remember to look at it, and then probably we'll tell you to post it on Piazza anyway. If you put it up on Piazza, another student might answer the question, or the, the TAs will get to it faster. Okay? Questions about this stuff before we go on? All right. So we're pretty much done talking about the process abstraction. Does anyone have any questions before we do our, before we would go to the Review round. Questions about processes. All right, so processes contain things that abstract core system components, CPU, memory, and the disk. So what specific parts of the process are used to abstract the CPU? Bart. Threads. Great. What about memory? Tim. What were, we call, what were we calling that rectangular thing that had some different, different areas lined up? Yeah, Jude. Address spaces. What about disk? What, we talked more about what we were using for the disk. Is it Spencer? No, it's not Spencer, clearly, because he's not looking at me. File handles. File handles. What's your name? Amit. Amit. File handles. All right. One or more threads, right? An address space and a file table map, mapping file descriptors, right, which are those ints to file handles, which are the objects that are shared after fork. All right? System call interface, components of the interface that are used to create processes. You guys will have a chance to implement all four of these system calls for assignment two. 
how do I create a new process? Fork. How do I replace a running process with an executable image? Frank. Um, exec. exec, all right. What about exit a running process? These are probably some of the easier questions I'm going to ask all term. <laughs> AJ. Ooh, return. Exit. <laughs> exit a running process. Collect the exit code of a child. Looking for someone who has an answer question. Sam. Wait. All right, good. File handles and the file table. So semantics of fork and exact. And again, these are kind of canonical semantics. There are variants of these system calls that do different things. But what does fork do to the process system table, Jeremy? Yeah. It makes a copy of it, which means that the parent and child are now sharing file handles. Because my file table contains file descriptors that are references to file handles. So after I copy it, I'm sharing file handles. What about exec? What does exec do, Jim? So that's what exec does to the process image. But what does it do to the file table specifically? Thomas? Yeah. Nothing. Nothing. Just leaves it alone. These slides, you know, if, if people are following along in last year's slides, the answers are all up there. So. Should keep that in mind. Um, so, why do I have these sort of canonical semantics with respect to the file system system calls? What is this allowed? What is this designed to enable, Sean? Sean, someone want to help him out? Change is starts with the right letter, but it's not the answer that I want. Sirach. It's a rude introduction to class. This is what happens when you show up late. We're in the middle of the slide. Uh, what explains the semantics of fork and exec with respect to the process file table? Why are the semantics set up the way they are? What is this designed to allow the child? Jen? Yes, this is for IPC. Jen? All right. To enable inner process communication. OK. So I told you that we would write this little simple shell. And this is it, essentially. This is not review. I don't think we looked at the slide last time. This is pretty much all we had left to do, though. So again, you know, with our little C-like pseudocode, this is probably the simplest possible shell that, that you could write. Right? This is a shell that uh, doesn't do anything special, doesn't put prompts, but essentially just reads lines of input, calls fork. So in this particular shell, who runs exec and who runs wait? Wembley. Yeah, could I do this the other way around? Could I have the parent run exec and the child run wait? Would that work? Why not? I mean, I've got two processes afterwards. Jeremy, I'm ignoring you. Uh, I'm ignoring you too. Right, right, because what is the return code here in this branch? I mean, it's, it's in the case statement, right? So it's 0, right? OK. Where is exit? So of our family of process-related system calls, we see three up here on the slide. Where is exit? Why is exit here? Who runs exit? Nick. Exit's involved, but where, where, where is exit? Uh, no, because the parent's here, right, running wait, right? So who runs ex exit? Oh, uh, Sean. Yeah, the, the, the new process that's forked has to run exit before wait will return, right? The assumption here is that this is a blocking call to wait, meaning that it will not return until the child calls exit. Questions about processes? Yeah. What do people think? So when I, this is a good, it's a great question. When I open a new file, I create the, if I create the new file handle if it does not exist already, right? And in fact, open always creates a file handle, right? Open creates a file handle and then it creates a descript, file descriptor in my file table pointing to that file handle. 
So that file handle will not be shared with my parent, right? Again, I, you know, the idea behind the semantics of fork and exec with respect to the file table is I give the parent and child some way to communicate, but I don't lock them into this forced you know, uh, civility forever. right? Like they can get away from each other. right? So again, what, let, let's say I'm the child, and for whatever reason, I want to have the same files open as my parent, but I don't want to share the file handles. What can I do? I'm ignoring you, Jeremy. Yeah. Uh, can you just have the child reopen the file? Yeah, so I can have the child go through its file table, close all those file handles, and just reopen the same files. Right? So figure out the files I had open, close all the existing file handles, reopen then those files, and now the parent and child will have the same files open, but they will not share offsets. Potentially, the file descriptors will be different, too. That really depends on how the file descriptor allocation is done. So it could be that the parent and child both have the same files open, but their file descriptors are different, and their file handles will definitely not be shared. Right? You guys will get a chance to work this out when you do assignment two. So you'll get some boots on the ground knowledge about this. Any other questions about processes? This is a good one. Yeah? That's a good question. Um, I think there might be cases, I'd have to look at this. I think the C library, for example, it's Akshay, right? The C library might install a signal handler that handles the signal that's generated by the child when it dies by just calling wait, right? The idea is I get a, the, the parent will get a signal when the child exits. And by default, it's possible that the C library for C programs will install a signal handler that just calls wait immediately and discards the exit code. Right? But the idea is I don't want to leave these zombies around. right? Because if I don't, until the parent calls exit, I have this zombie process. And I think the thing that prevents that normally is that normal processes are set up with the signal handle that will do that. Right? So um, if, and, and, the, and you know, again, that's, that's just a nice way of sort of keeping things clean and keeping things. Um, you know, the other thing is if the parent dies, then the child is reparented to init, and init will just sit there calling. Right? And it will figure out every, get, it, and it will receive those signals and just call wait over and over again. Right? Those return codes are just discarded. Yeah? Sure. Yeah, I mean, fork can fail. Yeah, fork, fork it frequently requires a fair amount of resources, and fork can definitely fail. So if fork fails, the idea is that I just return to the, um, if fork failed here, right, and again, this is why this isn't a great example. It would return a, a return code that would be not zero, probably negative. Right? So I think it returns a negative return code on error. Right? So what I would really need to do here is check if the return code is zero, I call exec. If the return code is greater than zero, I call wait. If the return code is less than zero, then I failed and I need to do something about it. Yeah. You're just <laughs> twisting your hand in the air suggestively. Guru. Yeah, oh, yeah, OK. Um, so there is, I, I do I have a slide on this or not? Uh, I wish I did. Yeah, I forgot to copy it over from last year's. Um, there is a, um, I don't want to get into this in great detail, the, but the C, so if you guys have programmed in C, you've used some of these calls, read, write, open, close, uh, exec, fork, that are part of the system call interface. The, the functions that you used are frequently wrappers around the system calls that are provided by the C library. So when you call fork, you're actually not calling sysfork. You're calling a function in the standard library that eventually calls sysfork. Right? And that function knows how to trap into the kernel. In fact, that's a good segue into what we're going to talk in, about today. Because, so you guys may have wondered, I mean, how do I, how do I make function calls into the kernel in the first place? Right? I mean, the kernel is not a library. Right? The operating system is not a library that I can just make a function call into in the normal way. Today, we will talk about how I cross the privilege boundary between an unprivileged user process and the privileged kernel. Right? And that involves hardware support and a very special instruction on the CPU provided for this purpose. Good questions. All right, any other questions about processes? You're still doing that thing with the hand wave. <laughs> OK. So, OK, so today, again, uh, just to review, we're going to start looking at how the operating system manages the, pro the processor. So, you know, for, first of all, remember, I mean, we're trying to do a couple of things here with our abstractions and, and with our multiplex. Remember, those are the two goals of the operating system, multiplex resources and, and provide useful abstractions, right? 
So when we start thinking about the CPU, which is what we're going to be thinking about for the next you know, three weeks, what are some of the limitations of the, of, or problems with the CPU that the operating system might be trying to address? Right? What are, what are, what, what's a limitation of the CPU or the, the, you know, the, the cores that the system might want to remove? Yeah. Yeah, but I mean specifically, what's wrong with the what's wrong with the CPU? Yeah, I mean the number of cores on my system, even if I have a multi-core system, is usually much smaller than the number of processes that are running on my system. What's that? Yeah, but, but the point is like now we're in a multi-core world, right? So it it. it you know, I'm, I'm trying to make sure you guys are aware of that, that most machines you buy today will not have one processor. They'll have two cores or four cores. But it doesn't matter, right? The number of cores is still smaller than the number of applications running on your system. If you do PS and count the number of running processes, it's probably several hundred. So even if you have a 16-way system, it's not enough, right? So I still have multiple processes that are trying to share the same physical resource, right? Or set of, set of cores, right? There's only one processor or, or 16 cores or whatever, so it's smaller than. All right. Um, so the other thing we're looking at is what, what are the mechanisms that are necessary to allow the processor to be shared? Right. This is getting ahead of ourselves, but so this is our goal here is to look at what are the first of all hardware features that the CPU has to provide to help the operating system uh, share the CPU and and switch things back and forth. And then also the mechanism specifically in the kernel for saving state and starting another process. We call that, that process a context switch. Right? And then finally, so, well, there's, I guess there's two other things. So what are some of the consequences for programmers of the fact that I'm going to be sharing the CPU in this way? Right? And this is what creates, especially in the kernel, but in any multi-threaded pro process, issues with concurrency and synchronization. Because you know, the, the big thing that's difficult for programmers to wrap their minds around is that in general, unless you are careful to make sure that, that this does not happen, your running process can be stopped and started at any point. Right? So what looks like a sequential series of instructions to the programmer can be interrupted at any point, And a bunch of other things can happen. And then you can start running again. Right? This is what makes multi-threaded programming very difficult, because our way of thinking about programming is inherently very single-threaded, but these systems are multi-threaded, and therefore context switches and concurrency take place. Right? And we'll talk about um, synchronization mechanisms that are designed to allow you to do this safely. This is particularly important in the operating system kernel. Right? The operating system kernel is a big, complex, multi-threaded program, and it also is one where you kind of got to get it right. Because if you don't, the whole system comes, is going to crash. Right? Like, if you have a bug in your multi-threaded web server and it crashes and you have to restart it and there's a few clients that sit there you know, with the spinning wheel in their browser for a minute, who cares? Right? I mean, that, that, that's, that's not great, but it's not the end of the world. Whereas blue screens are, tend, tend to irritate people right? and, and are a little bit. And then finally, so we talk, we're going you know, to look more at splits between policy and mechanism. So context switching is a mechanism that allows us to use the CPU to run multiple applications kind of at once, right? Uh, to share the CPU effectively. But how do we have good policies so that that happens well, right? What do I run? So now I have this problem, right? I've had this nice mechanism that allows me to switch things between the CPU, but now what do I run on the CPU at any given moment in time, right? Or what do I run on the cores that I have at any given moment of time? And this is essentially the problem of processor scheduling, right? And, and this is a very, very fun. And, and sort of deep area, and, and we won't spend too much time on it, but I hope we'll give you a little bit of an introduction to it. So this is kind of like, this is the overall game plan for the next few weeks. All right, so today the first thing we need to talk about is, um, and we really haven't discussed this yet in the class, but because we've, we've been looking, so far our description of the operating system has really, it's been like we've been talking about the C library, right? In many, in many ways, we have kind of been talking about the C library because fork exec and uh, wait and exit R C library calls that happen to use the operating system. But, um, but we've talked about how the fact that the operating system is like a normal program with some special privileges, or it's like a library that you might use, right? So today we need to start actually being more specific about how it's different than a normal program or a normal library, right? 
And the thing that's interesting, right, so up until now, and maybe, you know, maybe people haven't noticed it, but the things that we've talked about, the process-related system calls, none of them have actually required the kernel or the operating system to have any special powers. And you know, if you find that difficult to believe, I would urge you to go out and look at a user space threading library. Right? So if you go out and you look at like pthreads or other user space threading libraries, they provide library calls that essentially do these things. Right? They allow you to create new threads, allow you to change what a thread is running, allow you to um, you know, exit a thread, and allow you to, to, to wait on a thread and, and collect exit codes from threads. Right? And this is all done in user space. Right? And in fact, it's all done without any or very little involvement by the kernel itself. Right? So, so why, does, why does the operating system need special privileges? Remember, there were two things we talked about the operating system doing fundamentally. One was, does anybody remember what they were? Two things. What's, what's that? Uh, yeah, this a higher level, right? Multiplexing resources and what else? Abstractions, right? So multiplexing resources and abstractions. Processes are an abstraction, and we've seen, and again, I'm, I'm asserting here, and maybe you guys don't believe me, but I would go, you know, urge you to look at pthreads, that to some degree, abstractions don't require privilege, right? So why do I need, why do I need privilege? Why does the operating system have to have powers that other applications don't? Yeah. What's that? No, not necessarily. In fact, I don't think it will. Right? I mean, user space threading libraries are designed to provide user space threads. Right? So you can provide threads in user space, again, without the kernel having any idea that your process has multiple threads. Right? All the threading and s thread switching is done in user space. And there are advantages and disadvantages. To but I don't want to go down too far down that road. Right? So, so you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you today. We're gonna start talking about some of the special powers that the kernel has. But why does it why does it need these? Yeah. Okay. So so that's that's a that's the beginning of a good answer, right? So one of the things I want to be able to do is to keep one process from from harming another. But what does that involve? Okay, that's that's also a variant of what I'm getting at, Wembley. Keeps regular programs from accessing the hardware. Okay, I still think that what I'm trying to accomplish is something that would be difficult, if not impossible, if I allowed processes to access the hardware directly. So multiplexing, right? I just claim that in general, I don't need <coughs> privilege to provide abstractions, right? And you know, most of the libraries you have on your system prove this to be true, right? They provide abstractions, they provide new features, they provide nice wrappers around stuff that's gooey and gross. They don't require any special privilege, right? But multiplexing resources does. And the reason is pretty simple, right? I've got resources on my system, okay? I'm gonna divide them between the applications, right? And so there's two things that the applications on the system have to trust the operating system to do, right? So who can guess what these are? Were you raising your hand? Yeah. Or would you want to venture a guess, anyone? Okay, so okay, I'll, I will accept that, right? So the first thing that the that processes have to trust the operating system to do is divvy up the resources effectively. So when you write a program that runs on Linux or runs on Windows or whatever, you are trusting that the operating system will provide you the resources that you need to do whatever it is that you're trying to do. Right? And this is not an easy task because there's other things running and you know, the system may be very overloaded or whatever. Right? But you are trusting the operating system to give you what you need right? and to look at what else is happening on the system and trying to give you as much as you can, right? So there's fixed resources, there's a fixed amount of memory, fixed number of cores, 
you know, that can run at a, you know, basically maybe a variable speed, but you know, we can imagine a fixed speed. So there's some fixed amount of, of capability within the system, and processes have to trust the operating system to divide up that capability in an effective way. Okay? And then once I've done that, what else do I need to do? Yeah. Do you think that monitor and reclaim fits in this box? <laughs> One word. <laughs> right. yeah, but I mean, but yeah, I'm just going like, to smack those together and we'll have something that works. Right. Trust these divisions? Trust? Uh, well, the processes have to trust the divisions. That's more what we've been talking about. Yeah. Allocate or prioritize? Allocate, prior oh, I'll just give it away. Enforce. Once I've made the divisions, I have to make sure that the processes don't take more than I asked them for, right? I, I said, I'm giving you this much resource right now. And I can't have applications saying, well, I want more, right? And, and the reason for this, right, is, is, you know, processes can be some mixture of malicious and or buggy, right? So, you know, a, a malicious process might say, again, I'm not satisfied with the amount of memory that I've been allocated. I really know that that other process doesn't need that much memory, and it, he's just wasted. He's not doing anything with it, right? So I'm just going to take it away from him, right? And because I know that I'm the most important process on the system, and if I get more memory, I'll run faster, and I really know this will make the user happy, right? And, and we, we just don't trust processes to make that decision, right? And then also, you know, processes can be buggy. Right? So if I don't enforce these divisions well, then a process might just be like, oh, well, I'm just going to use this memory over here and hope that nobody else is using it. I'm really not sure. And you know, maybe, you know, maybe I'll just use it for a little while and nobody will notice and stuff like that. And, and we, don't, we don't allow processes to do this stuff. Right? So this, this is what creates the need for this privileged arbiter, right? which is the operating system curl. Jeremy. Is that what a fault is? Yes, and we will get there. Uh, Bring that, uh, return to that question in like a month when we talk about memory. Yeah, yeah. What is beeping over here? It's where? appreciate the fact that you're beeping. Why you're beeping. Well, that's going to irritate me, but I'll try to ignore it. Um, OK, so. So you might, you might say, like, we've been talking about operating system privilege, but what, is, what does this actually mean, right? What, what, it, what does it mean for the operating system to be a, the, the privileged program on the system or a privileged program, right? And what this comes down to, and this is why we start talking about this when we start talking about the CPU, privileged mode is a feature of the hardware itself. So privileged mode, privileged execution, is something that is implemented by modern CPUs, right? And what we're going to see, which is kind of a really fun and fascinating story, is over time, there's been a, you know, huge, as you would expect, there's been a huge amount of co-evolution of the operating system kernels and the hardware that they ran on, right? So there's been this continuous conversation between these two communities over a long period of time that comes down to, you know, what are operating systems trying to do and how can hardware help them and, and what sort of features does hardware need to provide in order to allow operating systems to do what they need to do. This is, this is one of them. Right, so this is something that emerged. I don't, you know, be good. I, I don't know enough about hardware to know exactly when this feature uh, got started. But the, you know, what, what CPUs allow is certain, you know, the, what's what's called a privileged mode. Right, so when I'm in privileged, or we'll frequently talk about this as kernel mode, because the kernel is the program that runs in this mode. Right. It means, there means a couple things. So first of all, typically there are special instructions on the CPU that I cannot access unless I am running in privileged mode, right? So certain registers on the CPU, certain uh, you know, uh, things, uh, certain parts of the CPU cannot be modified or cannot be changed in certain ways unless I'm running in kernel mode, okay? And if I'm not running in kernel mode and I try to do this, we'll get back to that in a few slides, right? So there, there are mechanisms for, uh, CPUs have mechanisms for enforcing this, right? So you have to ask, what happens if a, an unprivileged process tries to execute one of these instructions? We'll, we'll get to this, right? 
The other thing about the, C, uh, the kernel is the kernel frequently, when running in privileged mode, has a different view of memory, right? Uh, a, a view of memory that is different than the processes that are running, right? And sometimes this is actually implemented using the same mechanisms the processes use, but some, sometimes not, right? Um, so let's talk about some of the special instructions, right? So when I'm in C, and we're going to talk later about how I get in and out of kernel mode and, 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 uh, and user mode, right? Or unprivileged mode. So that's, you know, kernel is privileged mode, user is unprivileged mode, right? Um, so when the kernel is in, when the CPU is in kernel mode, there are these special instructions. And, and usually these are instructions that have something to do with resource sharing, right? So they're instructions that allow me to do the multiplexing that the kernel is, is in charge of doing, right? And I just talked through this slide without knowing it was here. So we'll just keep going. Um, the, the goal of protection boundaries on my system is fairly simple, right? What I want is, when I'm in kernel mode, I want to be running trusted kernel code. And when I'm running user code, untrusted code, right, code that I don't know where it came from or, or isn't designed and tested to allocate these resources, that runs in unprivileged or user mode, right? And the CPU implements these mechanisms to transition between them, which we'll talk about today. So just to um, give you some a picture of the fact that this is a little more complicated, most modern CPUs actually implement more than one privileged mode, right? So we're talking about this very black and white thing, where it's like privileged mode, where I can do anything, and I have access to all these instructions, and then unprivileged mode, where I don't have access to any of them, and I'm this unprivileged process. And usually, so x86 processors for a long time have, have had this notion of what are called protection rings, right? And there were, I think, four, right? We're from ring zero, which is fully privileged, to ring three, which is completely unprivileged. Um, and for many years, the operating systems that ran on these systems just used the top and bottom mode, right? So ring zero was kernel mode, ring three was user mode. Um, the interesting thing is that when people started to want to start virtualizing hardware architectures, which we'll talk about at the end of class, these other rings started to become interesting and important and potentially useful, right? So some of these rings are actually used by technologies like VMware to implement virtualization, right? Yeah? What's that? What do you mean by safe mode? Yeah, that, that, that has nothing to do with the process, right? That has to do with not loading certain libraries and not enabling certain features and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah that, 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 that doesn't map on to this, this at all. Okay. And again, just to make sure we're clear, when I talk about applications, we're talking about something running in unprivileged or user mode. When we talk about the kernel, we're running in privileged or kernel, right? So here's a question. I mean, what makes, what makes the, kernel, the kernel so special, right? And, and the answer is it's the application that's allowed to execute code in kernel mode. But here's a question for you, right? Why is the operating system allowed to run in kernel mode? You know, who, who chose, you know, this Windows binary is the leader of the system, right? I mean, who put, who put you know, uh, Linux in charge, right? I mean, who put, you know, the, the mock OS, you know, X kernel in charge? Who, who did that? Like, how did this happen? Yeah. Okay, so we're assuming that we need, a, we need an app and we need an operating system, right? And, and that, that's a good question, though. I mean, we talked a little bit about that no, beginning of class. Need it, but it's good if it's there. People who only program don't need to know about hardware. Well, well, again, I, I would argue it's, it's pretty, pretty critical for modern systems to have something that can divide up resources and, uh, and create some of these abstractions that programs are used to. But my question is more basic. It says, you know, you, how many people have a Windows computer? OK, how many people have a Mac? How many people use Linux? Who, why is the operating system on that machine allowed to run in kernel mode? Who, who did that? Yeah. Mm, can we be more specific? Yeah. No, no, no I'm, not, I'm not talking, maybe, it's, maybe this is more of a how question, right? Like, how did this come about? How did your machine become a Windows PC? Yeah. So, but, but that's assuming that it is a Windows machine, right? But how did it become a Windows machine? This is not a trick question. 
You installed Windows on the machine, right? You chose to make your machine a Windows machine. When you ran that installer, right, you exploited uh, you know, a feature of the system that allowed you to choose, right? It said, hey, by putting the CD in and following the prompts, you have elected this blob of code to be your operating system. Right? That's what you chose when you installed it. Yeah. What's your name? I'm, uh, Sharma. Sharma. I, I asked this question because the question is, how did a machine, how, how did this particular binary get blessed with this special power? Right? What's that? No, no, no. The, the question is why is, it, why is a particular operating system, right? Why is a on, on if the if the Mac OS is right, managing a machine, why was that operating system allowed to manage the machine as opposed to some other one, right? Where did the operating system come from? It doesn't come baked into the machine, right? It might, like, but somebody is, if you got a Windows machine and you bought it that way, someone installed Windows on it, right? And if you wanted to, you could install a different operating system. But the installation process is what is where you take, you know, you didn't know you were doing this, maybe, but you took a particular program and you allowed it to install itself on your computer so it could run in this kernel or privilege mode, right? And if you want to change it, you can change it, right? Um, and then people pointed out about boot, right? So, and, and this is how privileges bootstrap, right? So when machines boot up, I don't want to, like, boot is, you know, we could talk about boot for a month, right? Boot, bootstrapping systems is very, complex and, and interesting and ugly, but I'd rather not talk about it for a month, so I'm just going to skip over it very quickly and say that when a machine boots up, the CPU is configured to jump to, at some point, to jump to a particular, in, in, a particular memory address and start executing instructions. And the, when you install the system, you put code blessed by your operating system at that memory instruction. Right? And that's how the operating system starts to run when the machine boots. Right? So at some point during boot, and there's a lot that goes on during boot, the, the CPU jumps to a particular instruction and starts executing in privileged mode. Right? So when the system boots up, it jumps and starts executing in privileged mode. And your kernel is responsible for lowering the privilege level before running user code. Right? So there's instructions that allow it to, to surrender privilege, right? to say, I no longer want to run in kernel mode. But this is what happens on boot. Right? And if you look at your, you know, I would encourage you to do this, and I'm gonna, we're going to get Aditya to go through this in recitation maybe next week. Right? All the code for boot on your Sys161 system is there. Right? You can find the first instruction that your kernel starts executing at when it boots up. Right? And in fact, you can find the code that loads that stuff into that instruction. Right? So the point is that there's, there's some process where the CPU starts, jumps to an instruction, starts executing in privilege mode. That code that is loaded there is the kernel. Right? And that will start to do whatever else the kernel wants to do when it boots up. Right? So, so there's this question of how do we transition between privilege mode? So I have user mode and I have kernel mode. Right? I want, like I said before, I, I want my user code to run in user mode. And I want my kernel code to run in kernel mode. The question is, how do I get back and forth? Right? And we call the process of transitioning from user mode into kernel mode as a trap. Right? Or you call this trapping into the kernel. Right? You can think of it, um, that's probably why it's called this. I've never thought of it this way. But it's like setting a trap. Right? There are certain things on the machine that are traps. And as soon as the process hits them, the kernel will start to run. Right? So that's really how you can think of these things. You can think of them as traps that the CPU and the kernel have set for user programs right? that will cause the system to enter kernel mode. Right? So there, there's, this, there's this interesting question about you know, if, if you're running code in user space that makes a system call, right? what will happen eventually, and we'll talk about this in the next few slides, is that that code will trap into the kernel and the kernel will start running and take care of whatever the application asked it to do. So let's say I call open. Eventually, I trap into the kernel. I tell the kernel I want to open a file. And the kernel takes care of trying to open the file. Right? So I frequently think about the, th the thread that they executed the system call is now running in kernel mode. Right? So I 
run the I run a system call, I trap into the kernel, and now that thread is kind of running inside the kernel. Right? That's not um, completely accurate. It's accurate in terms of it's a stream of instructions that was initiated by the trap. Right? Um, but it's not accurate because the kernel thread has its own state and its own stack. And the first thing it does when you trap it in the kernel is save all the state for the user pro process so that it looks like a, looks like a, uh, you know, a, it looks like a function call. And the other, you know, the other reason this isn't accurate is that if you have system calls that don't wait for the kernel to complete, then what actually happens is I call open and I keep executing and the kernel starts doing something as well. Right? So, but you, know, you, can, you can decide how to think about this. And, and decide which way is more, most effective for you. But I like to think about traps as having the thread transition into the, in and out of the kernel. Right? So there are three reasons that we typically uh, transition into the kernel and start running in, in privileged mode. Right? One of them has to do with hardware. Right? So if a hardware device requests attention, right, and we call this a, a hardware interrupt, the second reason is that the code on the system requests attention. We call this a software interrupt or a system call. And then the final reason is that software needs attention. Right? And this is called a software exception. Right? So what's the difference, do you think, between requesting and needing attention in the framework here? Right? System call and a software exception. What's, I mean, you guys, we've been talking about system calls. So what's an example of a system call? Fork. Fork says, I'd like a new copy of myself to be made. Right? What's an example of a software exception? Yeah, that'd be one of them, right? Like dividing by zero, right? So needing attention indicates that the software has done something that indicates that it cannot go on executing. The kernel has to do something about this. The software has messed up, it has done something it shouldn't do. And the kernel needs to take care of it, right? There, there, it, it is something wrong, and the kernel has to take care of it. Usually, frequently by by killing the process that caused the software exception. Jeremy, you had a question. No. Seriously. Okay. So, so hardware interrupts. So, so again, we have interrupts that are generated by software. We have interrupts that are generated by hardware, and then we have these exceptions. All three of these will cause a very similar process to take place, right? So hardware interrupts are, fr are generated by hardware to indicate to the operating system that something happened that the operating system probably wants to know about. Right? And so it's like you know, the network card received a network packet over a particular interface. Right? Or the disk has finished reading the bytes that the, hard that the operating system requested. Um, there's also timers on a system that fire at regular rates that simply tell the kernel, hey, this much time has gone by since the last time I fired. Right? And maybe you want to know about that. Maybe you don't. Right? So at, at the sort of microarchitectural level, there are like a gazillion typos on this slide. That would be nuts. Um, at the microarchitectural level, processors interrupt these, implement these ideas of interrupt lines. Right? And, and interrupt lines is a good way to think about what's happening. It's, it's essentially a, a, you know, a little string that's connected from the kernel to some piece of hardware. And when that hardware needs attention, it, it yanks on that. Right? And the kernel feels like a tug you know, from the disk hardware interrupt line. It's like, oh, the disk needs something. Right? Or, or you know, the, timer, the timer sits there going like this you know, the whole time the system is running. Just, you know, yep, yep, another tick, another tick, another tick. Right? Um, so, and, and obviously, these aren't little pieces of string inside your computer, although that would be cool. Uh, they're, they're actually logic lines. Right? Hopefully, I didn't have to say that to anybody. Little, little thread. The thread on my disk broke. It's not receiving interrupts anymore. Uh, that's not what happens. Um, so, so when an interrupt is triggered, right? Here's what happens, right? And, and this is something that we're going to go over, over and over again. But it's important to get right. So, and these things, these things, you can essentially think of as kind of happening at the same time, right? There's not necessarily an ordering here, but this is the group of things that happens. Yeah. I'm, Yeah, so the CPU, the CPU implements these by having these, you know, these ports on it, right? where when there's a logic level transition, the next thing I'm about to tell you will happen. Right? OK, so the, first, you know, the, the things that happen are I enter privileged mode. right? So if I, was, if I was running in unprivileged mode, I'm now running in privileged or kernel mode. 
There's frequently some state about the interrupt that's recorded on the CPU, right? A register might be set to indicate which interrupt line caused the, the interrupt, right? Because when the kernel starts executing, it wants to know, like, did the disk wake me up, or the network wake me up, or the timer, or whatever, right? And then, this is the most important thing, well, the, the top, the privilege mode in this one are the most important thing. I jump to a predetermined location in memory, and I start executing instructions. So when, you know, and this is just how the processor is built, right? So when there's a logic transition on this line, I will enter privilege mode and I will start executing instructions loaded at some address, right? <laughs> and that address is usually fixed in the hardware, right? So a, pro like a particular type of processor will jump to a particular location and start executing instructions when an interrupt is triggered, right? So what we call the instructions that the processor executes when the interrupt fires, we frequently refer to this as an interrupt service routine. Right? This is a piece of code that's executed to service or you know, deal with this interrupt. Right? Um, and let me, let me just mention one more thing. Right? So, so who, like, the, the interrupt service routines are these little pieces of code. I mean, th those are installed by who? Right? Who, who this, this is part of what piece of code? Right? The interrupt service routine that I'm going to run when an interrupt occurs, what's going to happen? What code am I going to start to run? Yeah. What's that? So I'm, I'm jumping to a fixed memory address, but who put the code there that's going to start to run? Yeah. The kernel did, right? And again, you guys can find on your own system when the kernel boots, one of the first things it does, in fact, maybe even the first thing, is that it copies the interrupt service routine into the location in memory where it knows that the processor wants to find it. Right? Remember, memory is, is wiped out every time the machine turns off. So when I boot, my interrupt service routine isn't loaded yet. So the first thing the kernel does is load that. Right? Because until it loads the interrupt service routine, it can't take any interrupts. That's like kind of the most important thing that the, the kernel does during boot. Yeah, Wembley. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so this, is, this is a good point. Interrupts and traps jump to this address and start executing that code. And yes, basically every system call will start executing the same code the minute after the system call takes place. Right? That code is responsible for kind of figuring out what went on. Right? You know, you could have a system where, and, and there, probably are, there probably are systems that have different service routines for different interrupt lines. Right? That would be another way of doing it. You say, if the disk interrupted me, I start here. If the network interrupted me, I start here. But usually, you know, that's easier to do by just setting a register somewhere so that I know what happened when I start to execute. The interrupt service routines are usually like a tiny, tiny, tiny piece of code that just jumps into some other part of the kernel and, and starts executing. Right? On the MIPS, I think they're like 80 instructions is the limit for the interrupt service routine. So it's just the beginning of something, and then it's going to jump to some other part of the kernel. All right, so I think this is a good place to stop for today. On Wednesday, it is Wednesday. On Friday, we'll finish talking about hardware interrupts, and then we'll talk about ways that software gets the attention of the operating system currently.